uh, another webinar, another time in English, just like last week. We had our webinar with John Spencer from the United States. And once again, we have a guest from the United States. And this time, it's Trevor Muir. Trevor, are you there? I am here. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hello from Michigan. The, Michigan. The, du the Dutch capital of the United States, by the way. There's, so. there's even a town there called Holland, right? Yeah, I live 40 minutes from Holland. My wife's last name is Debar. Um, she's, her family is 100% Dutch. So I, I'm, I'm talking to my, my people right now. <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> or at least the people I married into. That's, that's very cool. Hey, we met um, three years ago, I guess, at the Educational Design Expedition. Uh, you held a keynote there back then, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, three uh, years ago. You released your book, The Epic Classroom, by then. Mm -hmm. And now you have a new book called The Collaborative Classroom. What's yes. the difference between those two? Well, the Epic Classroom really is kind of looking at the big, broad picture of how do we make classroom more engaging, more more memorable mm -hmm. to our students can like really have stories of their time in our classrooms that they're not going to forget soon after. The collaborative classroom is more of like a zoom into it, which we'll talk about in a minute. But how do we teach our students how to collaborate and develop this essential skill that we all need in the world? How can we do that in the classroom? Mm -hmm. And in these times, in these digital times, is it different to collaborate or Yeah, in these digital times, in this divided time, in this time where people need to learn to collaborate and come together and put our brains together. I mean, perfect example right now with COVID and this whole crisis, you've got scientists around the world who are no longer competing but collaborating mm -hmm. to, to solve this problem. And so, you know, how do, we, how do we teach our students, our citizens to really embrace this idea of collaboration so that they can do it the rest of their lives? That's cool. So I want to give the stage to you. It's up to you. Trevor, do your thing. All right, everybody. Well, here we go. This is a little awkward doing this virtual. I would much rather be with you in person right now, but that is not happening for a bit. So let's talk about this. Uh, the, the name of my presentation is Stop Calling Them Soft Skills Because There's Nothing Soft About Getting Fired. All right. Before we get into what that means. This is a, a video of me when I was in high school. I used to jump on the back of live alligators. I used to jump out of airplanes. I mean, uh, it, it was just a pretty wild growing up existence. If you knew me as a kid, as, an, as a high school student, a secondary student, you would say I was full of a lot of zest and energy. This is actually a picture of me my senior year of high school. Uh, and I just got to throw it out there. That is a wig. My hair never actually looked like that, although it would be pretty cool if it did. But that was me in high school when I wasn't in school. I mean, I was like the life of the party, this passionate pretty big character. I love doing open mic nights and playing guitar and acting silly and just, I was full of passion. But if you knew me when I was in school as a high school student, you, as if you were my educator, my teacher, you would think I was a pretty, I don't know, I use the word boring person, you know, like, because I usually, you would find me sitting in a desk in a row, not really talking to anybody, very low engagement in school, doing just enough to get the grades necessary to move to the next level. Very little passion, very little spirit, very little energy during school hours. Between eight and three, I was one person. And then between 3 p.m. and the rest of the time I wasn't in school, I was this person, the one that you see in this picture. And so it, it, I, I was just so uninvested in school. It, it just didn't really apply to me. I could care less about the content I was learning. I could care less about getting grades. I just wanted to experience life in the way that I did outside of school, and school didn't offer that to me. And as a way of really illustrating how disengaged I was with school, um, I'll tell you, when, when it was my senior year of high school, it was time to start applying for university, to go to college. Uh, all of my friends were applying all over the place. And I remember I was like, okay, I don't really care about college. I'm not really interested in higher education, but my mother has this expectation for me that you will get an education and there's not really a choice in the matter. Matter of fact, my grandfather raised money since I was a really little kid to pay or to help me go to college. And so I was like, all right, I'll apply to a school. And so I applied to a school called Florida State University. Um, and I only applied there because my stepbrother was going to FSU, Florida State, and they had really good parties. 
and I got to go and visit them. And I was like, okay, this is where I want to go to school. So my mom said, well, Trevor, you need to apply to a number of different schools in case you don't get into one, you'll have some backups. I was like, all right, mom, I will. Well, I didn't listen to her. I only applied to this one. I was a dishonest boy. So anyway, that spring of my senior year, my friends started getting these letters in the mail telling them if they were accepted or not. And I remember opening up my letter. It came in the mail. It had that emblem, that logo on it. I opened it up and I was really excited. And it said, Dear Trevor, we would like to inform you that you are on the wait list for Florida State University. I was like, the wait list? What is that supposed to mean? I, I, and I assumed, okay, well, you just have to wait a little bit longer than everybody else before you get accepted into the school. So I was like, all right, well, I'm basically in, so I might as well tell everybody I got in. So I told all my friends I got into Florida State. I told my mother I got into Florida State. I told my grandfather. I even let him write me a check to pay for tuition because I assumed I was in because I was on the wait list. Well, the rest of that, I mean, again, this is an illustration of how little I actually cared about school at this point in my life. And so I kept waiting the rest of that semester, still did not get the acceptance letter, still didn't get the acceptance letter. Finally came summer, I still didn't get the acceptance letter. And then finally, it was the week before school started, the first week of college, and I still wasn't into the school. And so I finally had to come to terms with the situation, and I did what any rational 18-year-old boy would do in this situation. I packed up all of my things and I moved five and a half hours north to Florida State University, making myself and everybody else believe that I got into the school, which I didn't. My mom thought I was moving away to school and I got there and I didn't know what to do. I, I literally was paying for an apartment because I was supposed to be going to school, but I didn't get into the school. And so I went to the Dean of Education at Florida State. I went to her office the day before school started and I asked her secretary if I could get a meeting with her because I really needed to talk to her. And her secretary said, well, do you have an appointment? And I was like, well, no. And she goes, well, the school year starts tomorrow and there's 39,000 students at Florida State. There is no way she's going to be able to meet with you today. I said, well, do you think I can just sit in the office and maybe if she has time, I can talk with her? She said, you're welcome to sit, but there's no way she's going to meet with you. And so I sat in this office for seven and a half hours and all day long I watched this dean come in and out of her office and she kept looking at me. And finally, after seven hours, she came out and she pointed to me. And she said, come here. I was like, okay. So I went and I sat down in her office and she said, what can I help you with? And I said, ma'am, I have been on the wait list for a long time and I'm wondering if it's still possible that I'll get in before Monday when school starts. She like looked at me and laughed and she said, no. Unfortunately, if you're on the wait list still, that means you were rejected. I'm sorry we didn't send you a letter. I said, ma'am, I need to go to Florida State. It's been my dream my entire life to get a college degree. It's something I've always cared about and strived for. And she goes, well, looking at your grade point average from high school, it sure doesn't seem this has been a dream of yours. I said, yes, I had a couple rocky years there, but I've really improved them my senior year. And I will do so well at school because I am motivated and I have to go here. And I gave a really good speech. And she looked at me with these like, these shrewd eyes. And she said, all right, I'm going to push A on my computer. I'm going to accept you into the school, but I'm going to be keeping a very close eye on you. Don't make me regret this. And she pushed A on her laptop and I was accepted into Florida State University. <laughs> I talked my way into college. And as I was leaving her office, I was jumping and cheering. I couldn't believe it, but I wasn't cheering by the sheer fact that I was going to go to the same school that the famous author Hunter S. Thompson went to. I wasn't cheering by the fact that I'm going to go to the same classrooms as Pulitzer Prize winning authors and Nobel Peace Prize winners. I wasn't cheering that I'm going to go to the same school as the astronaut Norman Thagard, one of the very first people in outer space. I wasn't excited about the fact that I'm going to go to the same school as Burt Reynolds. I was cheering that now my mother isn't going to kill me and hide the body. Are you with me? That's all I cared about. 
I got into school because I was expected to. And so therefore I put very little effort in my education career into making this happen. This is further evidenced by later down the line when I was in college, I took this creative writing class. I decided to get an English major, not because I cared about English, but I've always been decent at writing and reading and speaking. And I was like, you know what? This is the easiest way for me to get a degree and then get out of here. And so I took this writing class. It was towards the end of college. It was an advanced writing class. And there was a professor named Barbara Hamby. And I remember on the very first day, she said to the entire class, about 60 students, she said, this semester, you're going to write a portfolio of all your very best writing. You're going to do a lot of writing for me. You're going to turn in this portfolio and I'm going to choose one of them. I'm going to choose the best from this entire class. And I'm going to invite you to be my personal understudy at the end of this semester. And I watched a few students get really excited about the prospect of being the personal understudy for this professor, Dr. Barbara Hamby. And again, I could really care less. And so that semester I did a lot of writing and I, I actually enjoyed it. it. It was fun to get to learn to write in different ways. And so I did all this writing. I turned in my portfolio, not thinking much of it. And then at the end of the semester, I got my portfolio returned to me. And on it, there was a note that said, Dear Trevor, I would like to invite you to be my personal understudy next semester. Signed, Dr. Barbara Hamby. I was like, well, that makes me feel pretty good. And so as I was registering for classes that next semester at the university, I only needed one more English credit, and this could be it, working with her. As I was registering, I saw that there was another professor available, and I'm not going to tell you his name because maybe somebody knows him, but there was another professor available, and I remember everybody telling me that he is the easiest professor in all of Florida State University. In fact, my stepbrother had him the semester before, and he said, oh, this semester, half the time you'll get to his class, and it'll be vacant. He'll just have a sign on the door saying classes canceled. And then the other half of the time you get to his class and he will actually take you to the restaurant across the street and buy all of the students free beer and chicken wings. And so I had a choice to make as I was registering for my final English class. Do I want to take this rigorous writing experience with Dr. Barbara Hamby, have to learn to write and work under this professor, this tenured professor, and probably work harder than I'd ever had to work before for an English credit? or free chicken wings and beer. Of course, I chose free chickens and wings and beer, people. What do you expect, right? So I chose that option. And let me tell you, it was everything that was promised to me. It was the easiest class I'd ever taken in my life. Well, through a chain of events, past this incident, after I took this really easy, awesome class where I got to drink a lot of beer at school, um, I was given the opportunity uh, to mentor somebody, to tutor her, and then I decided I needed to become a teacher. I'll tell more about this in a little bit. But I discovered I wanted to be a teacher. I had to be a teacher. And so I'll talk more about it in a minute. But anyway, I, uh, I had to take this class in college to become a teacher. So I, I graduated. I returned back to school to get my teaching certificate so I could actually be licensed to teach. And I took a class on how to teach writing. And the professor was this pretty well-known locally professor. And on the very first day of this class, she asked all of these future teachers, myself included, who is your biggest influence to become a writer? And everybody's sharing. And I remember I raised my hand and I said, oh, I had a really great professor in college. Her name was Dr. Barbara Hamby. I learned a lot from her. And this professor stopped what she was doing. She stopped me and she said, wait a minute, who was your professor? I said, oh, her name was Dr. Barbara Hamby. She was great. She goes, oh, that's what I thought you said. Dr. Barbara Hamby's my favorite author in the world. She's just one of the best poets ever. You got to take a class with her? And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, I didn't know she was famous. I, I passed up an opportunity to be her personal understudy for free chicken wings and beer. Are you with me? Like I passed up this rigorous experience that would have been hard and challenging and I took the easy way out. And I, when I tell this story, it's embarrassing. It puts a pit in my stomach because I, I can only imagine how much better of a writer I would be today, how much better of a communicator I would be if I would have taken Dr. Hamby up on her offer. But instead, I went the easy way. And, and when I look back on it, it's like, you know what? When you look at life as this unfolding story, you can identify these moments that are hard to swallow, but they actually teach you something, right? Like I learned something from this experience. Here I learned that, you know what? When you don't put in the effort, when you avoid hard work, there's consequences to it. But the truth is, 
I know why I avoided the difficult class. I know why I didn't take the rigorous understudy experience and instead took this other very, very easy blow off class. It was because there was nothing driving me to put in that extra work. There was nothing driving me to want to put in the work ethic and the time and the effort in order to, to succeed and get, you know, the, the real payoff. You know, it's, as I said earlier, I decided at one point at the very end of my schooling that I had to be a teacher. I was looking back and I was reflecting on my whole life and how I got to this point. And I remember I thought about this one teacher I had my sixth grade year of school uh, when I was about 11 or 12 years old. And it was, it was this teacher named Mr. Peters. And this man single-handedly helped save my life. He helped mentor me through my parents' divorce when they split up. He, he taught me how to write and read and embrace life and passion. I remember thinking at him about him at about 22 years old. And I was like, you know what? If I have this college degree in writing and I have the potential to have an impact on somebody the way that Mr. Peters had an impact on me, maybe maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should be an educator, a teacher. And so anyway, I had this fire burning in me. I had to become a teacher. All of a sudden, I, I, I determined, you know what? I've got to change a little bit about who I am and how I interact in this world if I'm going to actually achieve this goal in front of me. And so as I had this goal in mind, this end goal of becoming a teacher, I started working like I'd never worked before. I got a, a job outside of school and I was working 40 hours a week in this job just so I could support myself in this, this teaching school, this whole endeavor. I started writing and reading and putting in all of this time and effort. I was developing work ethic for the very first time in my life because if I didn't work hard, I wasn't going to achieve this goal. You know, I was learning how to communicate. You know, I was able to like make people laugh and do all these things in my personal life outside of school. But now I had to learn how to communicate complex ideas to students. I had to learn how to communicate to parents, which is a whole different thing. I had to learn to communicate with my principals and my school leaders. I had to learn how to get ideas across in brand new ways. I never had a reason to learn how to communicate before this. But if you want to become a teacher, you have to know how to communicate. And so I developed that skill. I all of a sudden was building confidence in myself. I was having wins as I was interning and working in schools and finding out that, man, I have the ability to help shape and change kids' lives and help them grow and believe in themselves. I was developing confidence myself. I was learning how to work with other people. I was collaborating. I was I was working with other teachers and educators in my building to come up with plans and ideas to put things together. I was learning how to collaborate most of my education experience was spent sitting in rows by myself with nobody else. My grades, my personal achievement, my work, and very little about the collective, about community. But in order to be a successful educator, you have to collaborate. And so I was learning how to do that because I really wanted to become a teacher. Are you with me so far? I was learning to critically think and solve problems. You know, the first teaching job, and it's a little different nowadays, but the first teaching job that I ever got, 400 other people applied for that position. It was a very competitive time to become a teacher in the state that I live in. Um, and so I had to learn, how am I going to solve this problem of getting to the top of the interview sheet to get people to invite me? How am I going to secure this job? How am I going to solve this problem? I was learning how to critically think something I didn't really have to do a whole lot of my education experience. A lot of my education experience was just listening to what information was given to me, process it, put it down on a test and then discard it and then move on to something else. Now, I was actually having to solve real problems because if I didn't solve these problems, I wasn't going to become a teacher. I was learning to adapt. I was learning to work on the fly and, and deal with new challenges and technologies, all these things that were difficult, but I had to learn to adapt to them because if you want to be a teacher, you have to know it to, how to adapt. So this is what I want to sum it up with that. In order to be a teacher, in order to achieve this goal that I had for myself, I had to develop soft skills soft skills. And, and, and the only way that I was able to develop these skills, these essential skills to being successful was to have a purpose driving me to do that. You know, I love this quote. It says a strong why allows us to withstand any how. So why am I doing this? Because I have to be a teacher. 
you know, and some maybe some of you have that same fire burning in you. I've got to educate people. I love this subject matter, or I love helping people find success. I love building confidence. I love innovating and trying new things. Whatever your purpose is, if you have a strong enough purpose, that's going to help you overcome any of the obstacles that get in your way. These things, these lists of essential skills were obstacles for me. You know what I mean? If I would have had those earlier in life, I probably would have overcome more things. I would have had more experiences. I would have grown more, but I didn't have anything driving me. But when I had purpose, it drove me to develop these essential skills. You know, when I think about what's the ideal graduate, when our students leave our schools, our classrooms, what do we want them to look like? And my guess is, is that school isn't producing all of the traits we want in our students Right? It's not producing collaborate, collaborative kids as much as we need it to, and critical thinkers, and confident, and problem solvers, and adaptable students. Is school doing that? Or does school put a lot of emphasis on learning the technical skills, the hard knowledge, which is still important, but what about all these other ones that are absolutely essential in order to succeed? I mean, go and Google the word soft skills school, or soft skills millennials, or soft skills um, workplace, and you will see article after article that have headlines like this, the nine reasons talented millennials get fired. You know, if you go look at this article, every one of the reasons can be tied back to soft skills or the lacking of soft skills. They don't know how to do these essential things and therefore they don't get, they don't get to keep their jobs or they don't get jobs in the first place, which raises questions, by the way. If the number one reason people are fired from their jobs is that they don't possess soft skills, maybe they're not actually soft because there's nothing soft about getting fired. Maybe we need to start rethinking what these skills actually look like and how we use talk about them. I mean, we can call, keep calling them soft skills if you want, but really these are essential skills. Essential skills, meaning we need them just as much as the ability to obtain and process information. I mean, a, a survey of 3,000 employers was put out, and these are the top skills sought by employers um, in, uh, in, you know, in, in 2019, I think is when this was put out. And Frank, if maybe if you can move that screen over just a little bit, um, just so it can, we can read all of them. But the number one skill is the ability to work in a team structure. So the ability to work in a team structure, that's number one. You know, I teach at a university here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I have a, a continuing education student. So he's already got a full-time career, and he's an accountant, and he's going back to school to get his degree. And he told me this year that he uh, his Christmas bonus, so the determination whether he gets extra money on his paycheck every year, is based on his teamwork skill at his company. So an accountant, somebody who literally just crunches numbers – is given extra money if he's able to collaborate better, which raises questions, wait a minute, that's how his bonus is determined, how he works with other people? Isn't accounting a solo venture? It's like, no, actually, no. It's the number one skill sought by employers for a reason. When people work together better, they solve bigger problems. They, they come up with bigger ideas, better ideas, bigger innovations. You know, I talked to an engineer at Google last year as I was writing my book, um, The Collaborative Classroom, and uh, I was talking to her and she was telling me about the collaborative environment that exists at Google. And uh, she was telling me that Google invests millions of dollars into her specific team to become more collaborative. You know, they're sent away on retreats every other month as a team to just be together and spend time together and have vacations together. They're given meal stipends to have meals together and breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day at work. Google puts millions of dollars into their work environment and giving them space to where they can turn and talk to each other and they have noise canceling headphones so that they can sit in a collaborative environment but be able to turn sound on and off. It, they, they're absolutely about collaboration. And I asked this engineer, I said, why? Does does Google put so much emphasis into collaboration? Is it just because they, they just want everybody to be happy? And she goes, well, yeah, they want people to be happy. Yeah, happier people are more productive people. But what Google has found is that when people are more collaborative, they're often they're also more profitable. So what do you mean? She goes, we've learned that we make more money for shareholders at Google when we collaborate well. I said, well, that blows my mind. 
Collaboration is necessary. It's ne I mean, just look at, I, I'm going to give it a little dig here. Just look at American politics. I got to be honest, I don't know anything about uh, uh, Dutch politics right now, but I can tell you American politics is defined by division. It's defined by lack of collaboration, lack of compromise, lack of critical thinking and working together. I mean, it's desperately needed over here. And I'm assuming that it's desperately needed where you live as well. And so we need more collaborative people. And so we've got to create work that makes our students more collaborative. Number two, the ability to communicate is an essential skill. The ability to plan and organize work is an essential skill. The, number four, the ability to solve problems is an essential skill. And then number five, the ability to obtain and process information is an essential skill as well. That's the one that's focused most on in school in general, the ability to obtain information. It's still important. It's still valued. We still need people to learn how to do complex math and understand complex uh, scientific problems. And we still want people to be able to read literature and, and digest it and understand it. We still need to do number five on this list. But there are four in front of it, right? Those are essential skills. They are not soft. And so we've got to think about that. How can we implement them in our classrooms? How can we focus on them and give them emphasis? I mean, think about as an educator yourself, whether you're a classroom teacher, a professor, whatever you do, what essential skills do you use most in your work? Do you use communication? Are you a critical thinker? Are you a collaborator? Do you, are you adaptable? Are you, are you confident in what you do? What essential skills do you use most in your work? Because I'm willing to bet that it's more than just knowing your content. Am I correct in that? Do you do more than just be a subject matter expert? Of course you do. But here's the thing. These are skills. They have to be learned. They're like muscles. You know, I like to think of it. I, I love to think of skills as muscles. We all have them. So we all have the potential to learn these skills. But if you don't work them out, they're going to atrophy. The students aren't going to have them. They're not going to have them when they graduate school and go into the real world. If they don't know how to communicate, it's not like they're just going to be born with it one day. Like, oh, I can all of a sudden communicate with people. Or, oh, I can all of a sudden collaborate and work with difficult people who I don't necessarily like. No, we've got to work those muscles out. And so we've got to create education experiences that work them out in a productive way. We've got to create work for students that requires essential skills to succeed. So I want to give you a little example of this. Um, uh, this is a woman named Deet Eamon, and I'm probably pronouncing her name wrong, but I, I got to meet Deet a few times. But Deet Eamon is from The Hague, Netherlands, so she's right by you. And uh, and maybe it's from people from The Hague right now, maybe you've already heard of her. But this is Deet Eamon, and she was part of the Dutch resistance during the Holocaust. And uh, Deet and her fiancé would smuggle their Jewish friends out of the city into the countryside and hide them from the Nazis during the invasion, during the Holocaust. And she did this for several years as a 17-year-old girl. And she kept pulling them out and she would go and find down fighter pilots from the Allied forces and hide them from the Nazis. I mean, she was an essential part of the Dutch resistance, an absolute hero until she was captured by the Nazis and put in a concentration camp where she was expected to be executed any day. And, and in fact, her fiance was executed. But then one day she heard tanks outside and she thought, oh, this is where they're going to line us up and kill us. And she went and looked. And uh, it was actually the Allied forces knocking down the walls of the concentration camp where she was liberated. So I told my students, my high school students, the story of Deet Eamon. And I pulled up this very picture um, and I told them all about her. And I told the same story and with a little bit more gust and zest. I'll, for the sake of time, I shortened it. But I told them about Deet Eamon. And I said, guys, what would you do if I told you that Deet Eamon, this, this war hero, this girl who was a teenager and helped save the Netherlands during the invasion of the Nazis, what if I told you that she is still alive? And my high school students were like, what? Like, that's like ancient history for them. Most of them didn't have grandparents or parents who fought in that war. So they were like, wow, that's wild. I said, what if I took it a step further and I told you that Deet Eamon actually lives three miles from our school right now here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that's when my students were like, Bruh. I mean, they had no idea they were living down the road from someone like her. And then I told them, I said, guys, did you know there's other people who survived the Holocaust or were part of the resistance? They were part of the military that ended the Nazis, ended the invasion, ended that whole time period. They fought for that. Did you know those heroes live by us too? And nobody knows their stories and they're dying at a rapid rate because that's what happens when you get into your 90s. Did you know that? 
And my students didn't know that. I said, so what should we do about it? And so we did a little bit of brainstorming. If we had more time, I would go more into that process. But we did some brainstorming. And they said, well, let's go and talk to people like Deet Eamon herself. There she is. Let's go talk to World War II heroes like that one right there. And uh, let's, let's go interview them. And then let's take their interviews. And we don't have a lot of technical inf- like equipment, but we do have phones and we do have boxes and, and duct tape and whatever. Let's go film these heroes. And then let's do something with the with these films. Let's and and we did the whole brainstorming, and they said, well, what if we created documentaries based on these things? What if what if we created biographies about these these World War II heroes? What if we created podcasts? What if we created artwork? What if we did all this? What if we put it on display and invited the whole city to come out and learn from these heroes before they're gone, so that their stories stay even when they're gone? And so we did this whole big project, and I want to tell you about how we developed some of their essential skills because they had this purposeful project. Again, it's going back to purpose. The best way to get our students to develop essential skills is to give them a reason to. Becoming a strong collaborator is hard. (laughs) Becoming a strong communicator is difficult. Becoming a problem solver, an adaptable person is not easy. But if you have a strong reason to, if you have a strong why, you will do the work necessary. So for this one, how do we capture Deet's story? How do we capture these veterans' stories? All right, well, then let's get organized. And so, like, this is an essential skill, the ability to organize and process, prioritize. So we did project management. And I would have students fill out logs like this one, a project management log, recording what task do you want to accomplish, who's responsible for that task, when is it due, what's the status of it, trying to keep their ducks in a row. There's a great program called Trello. So if you want to write it down, T-R-E-L-L-O.com. It's an awesome project management school tool, you know, to where students can create columns. Like, oh, here's a to-do column. Here's a doing column. Here's a done column. And they can assign who is doing what. So Mary's going to craft the storyboard. Kyle's going to transcribe video. Lainey's going to search for B-roll footage. Johnny's going to edit the podcast. Oh, here's what we still have to do. We still need to interview more family members. Translate, blah, blah, blah. Here's what's done. They can drag and drop it. They can add their teacher to this. So their teacher can go in and review what they're doing. But this is a way of teaching them how to stay organized. Because the truth is, when they leave school, they might not use Trello. But they will probably use a calendar or a to-do list, or maybe they will use Trello. Whatever it is, we want to teach them to be organized. That doesn't come naturally. Just to ask my six-year-old. It doesn't, you don't just naturally know how to organize and prioritize time. You have to be taught how to do that. And what happens in traditional school, the teacher does all the organization and the prioritization, right? This is what we're learning today. This is the work that you're doing. This is when the test is. But when you have a real test like this, It's changing. It's flexible. It's fluid. But we still need some organization to it. And so doing something like this teaches them to become organized. If you're not organized, you're not going to be successful. If you're not organized, you're not going to accomplish what we need to accomplish, which is sharing the story of these veterans. Collaboration. I've talked about that. It's a hard one. I mean, I'm sure you could list a bunch of reasons why collaboration is difficult. You know, one of them is I call it hogs and logs. You've got group members who hog all the work and doesn't let anybody else do anything. Or you've got the logs who just lay there the whole time while the hogs have to drag them along. Right. Collaboration is hard. Holding people accountable is difficult. But we have to teach people how to do that. You know, for a project like this World War II one. It takes a lot of collaboration. There's a lot more to it than just, oh, I'm just going to film this and make a documentary. No, you've got to work with a group of people. You've got to have people that are doing this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. And so we want to organize that. And we've got to teach them how to do that type of collaboration. You know, this is a tool I use. It's called the group contract. And it's just a way of holding, of, of, for students to hold each other accountable. They write down their expectations for each other, um, what, what they want to do to hold each other accountable. They sign the contract saying, we all agree that we're going to do these things. Here's the accountability measures we're going to take if you violate the contract. And that's really up to you as a teacher, what happens if they violate with each other. But yeah, using a contract, teaching them accountability. Uh, and you can access any of the resources I share here and a lot more free ones just like this one on uh, this web page here, trevormuir.com slash resources. Um, you can get the group contract template, the project management log, rubrics, a lot of other stuff. But again, it's really about teaching collaboration, you know, and creating a, a collaborative culture. Here's the truth. A lot of our students don't know how to collaborate because they've never had to. And so we don't want to just dive in and say, okay, guys, we're going to do this really complex big project with a really high stakes 
um, go ahead and start collaborating. It's actually we have to create a culture for them to collaborate successfully in. You know what I mean? That's why like I always start my school year. <laughs> start my school year by having them do collaborative activities like this. You know what I mean? Just some silly stuff where they're in groups, having to build towers, to uh, work together, whatever it is. It's, it's setting a foundation for collaboration to occur. You know, I also have like class contracts that we craft together. How can we like set the stage from the beginning of the school year, the beginning of the term about, hey, this is how we're going to collaborate together. Um, so anyway, th those can be accessed otherwise. I'm giving you a really speedy version of this because I want to start wrapping it up here. But again, hopefully you're getting the idea that we've got to create space for them to develop these skills and we've got to give purpose behind doing it same with communication communication isn't easy communication doesn't necessarily come natural to everyone but communication is the top three reasons why people leave their jobs this is our survey i recently read the top three reasons people leave their jobs are communication related it's either the company to employees so the company is not being clear about what they need or it's the employees to the company the employees are not voicing what they need, their concerns, or it's employees to employees. People don't know how to talk to each other. And so we've got to teach people how to communicate with each other. You know, we all want parameters and direction and clarity. We all do, right? You know, I love this graphic. I, I don't know if you can see, it's a little blurry. One of the doctors is holding a pair of legs with bones sticking out and the other one's saying, and that is why we lift on three, right? Like, it's clarity. We want it. We need it. Our students need it. And they need to learn how to give it when they communicate with others. And so I think it's important that we vary audiences for students. You know, like when they presented this one, which I'll tell about at the end, when they presented this World War II one, their audience was this huge crowd and they had to present and communicate with a lot of people. Sometimes can you give them an authentic task where they have to communicate with uh, people within their organization, within their community, bringing in a school leader for them to talk to, uh, learning how to talk to each other, learning how to talk to professionals, use the phone, send emails, whatever it is, varying up audiences for them to learn to communicate to. You know, also asking them, teaching them to really figure out what is the purpose of my communication? What am I trying to achieve with this? Am I trying to persuade somebody? Am I trying to inform them? Am I trained to entertain? What's the purpose of communication? And then lastly, with communication is listening. You know, this is a hard one. This doesn't necessarily come easy to really anyone is how to truly listen to somebody else. And so I just want to sum it up by saying we've got to teach them how to do that. And I think the best way to teach them how to do these difficult things are sure using exercises. I'm going to skip this one, but using activities like active listening activities or, you know, doing icebreakers and mixers for them to learn how to communicate and collaborate. But really, it's about having purpose for them to learn these skills. What's my reason for communicating? Is it just a grade? Is that why you're making me give a speech for a grade? Or is it just because my parents expect me to? Because that doesn't work for a lot of students. Why am I actually communicating? Oh, is it because if I don't communicate, I won't get to achieve this authentic task in front of me. I won't get to achieve this purpose. And so we've got to design purposeful activities for our students to do. Um, I also think it's important to have a discussion-based classroom, you know, constantly challenging them to discuss with each other, creating a list of ground rules for them to discuss about, using different techniques to help them discuss. Um, and if you want more detail on this, this isn't a book pitch, but I do outline a lot of these discussion methods in my book, The Collaborative Classroom. And that's really about how do I uh, create a classroom where my students are developing that essential skill. Um, also teaching them how to give critical feedback to each other. So I'm going to do a little skipping and as we wrap it, wrap it all up. Um, my students had to do a lot of things they didn't know how to do for that World War II project. They had to use graphic design programs. They had to use video editing. They had to make cold calls and call people they were uncomfortable with. They had to call family members and they had to use translation thing. Uh, you know, they had to use translation apps. They had to do a lot of things that they didn't know how to do and that I didn't know how to do. I don't know how to teach somebody graphic design. That's not my expertise. I don't know, you know what I mean? Like I, I don't know exactly how to de de develop your films in Premiere, that, that web platform. You're gonna have to figure it out. Um, and so I wanna show my students that I can model the learning. How would I figure this out? But I don't wanna teach them specifically how to do these tasks. I want them to learn how to use these tools, how to develop these skills. That's where the real secret sauce is. If you say, you know what, I'm not gonna teach you how to create this film, 
I'm going to make you do it. But this is what I would do. I would probably go on YouTube and look up how to use this function in the video editing platform or how to use this program to use graphic design. What I'm doing here is I'm modeling the learning process but not the actual task so that they're learning these essential skills. They're developing them themselves. Like this is them creating artwork for the program because then eventually we did have this big event and 400 people showed up to it. Totally unexpected. 400 people showed up with a veteran sitting in the front row as the guest of honor to look and observe my students' work, to watch the work, the films, the art, the podcasts, all of this stuff created by 14-year-old high school students. This was their authentic audience. If my students did not work on developing their essential skills throughout this project, all of the people in that crowd would have been let down. Their, their essential purpose for this project would not have been achieved. There was something driving the hard work that they were doing. So what happens when you do all this kind of work? You develop confidence. You know, you learn that you can do difficult things. Students have to learn that. Confidence isn't just grown or it doesn't just appear, it's grown, right? You have to develop it. And it can only be developed by doing actual hard work, by failing, by iterating, and then followed by success. So with all of that being said, you can see I overplan. This is an essential skill. Overplan, so in case you run out of things to say, you always have something to say. So I want to wrap it up by this. Um, let's talk about work spirit. We want our students to be hard workers, right? We know that when we are gritty, when we have that work ethic, when we have this attitude that drives us, in fact, the word spirit, that which animates us, what animates our work? So for you, what animates you as an educator? What makes you put in the extra hours, the extra effort, the extra creativity? What motivates you to want to get on a, a, a Skype call at 8 p.m. at night and watch something like this? What is your work spirit and how do we develop it in our students? You know, my sweet, sweet mother um, went through cancer treatment a few years ago and she was a single mother of five kids in the process. This was a while ago. This is when I was a kid. She went through cancer treatment. She, uh, she was running a business, working 80 hours a week, run, working with five kids, uh, just challenge after challenge after challenge. And I remember asking my mom one time, I said, mom, how the heck did you do it? Cause your life then was so much harder than anything I've ever had to experience. How did you do it? And my mom she said, it was my five kids. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I was so dedicated to making sure that you guys could be successful, that there was nothing, not even cancer, could stop me from doing that. And so like it was this message, this reinforcement to me that when we have a strong why, we can overcome any how. And we will embrace hard work because of it. I love this quote from my friend Mike. He says, the reward for hard work is more hard work. When you work hard, expect more of it. When you work hard and get a promotion, well, now you're gonna have to work harder than you did, but you embrace it because you have this work spirit. You have this purpose that's driving you. Mike Rowe, the host of Dirty Jobs, says, don't follow your passion, but always bring it with you. We don't have to be passionate about everything that we're doing, but if we're passionate people, we can do anything. And we've gotta teach our students that, to be passionate, hardworking, skill-developing beings so that they can succeed now and succeed later on. Here you go, Frank. That's it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, here I am. Thank you so much, Trevor. Yeah? Yeah, great. Working. Was that 40 minutes? 42 minutes. Time flies when you're having fun. Top on. It was 40 minutes. Well, you great timing. An essential skill, right? There you go. <laughs> I will... Uh, Show that uh, your uh... great. Yeah, I have a Facebook group as well. The Epic Classroom is really just where I post a lot of my videos and, and blog posts and articles and resources. So yeah, you can connect with me on there. Instagram is a little bit more personal. Feel free to follow me on there, and then Twitter as well. But yeah, would just love to connect and. Um, always open to conversation about how we can make school more realistic and innovative. I have a couple of questions uh, according to your story. Um, are you familiar with the term um, uh, curling parents or curling teachers? Do you know the sports curling? Where they're I know sweeping curling, yes. with those brooms? 
So yeah, over here we call it help. We we call it lawnmower parents. A lawnmower mow parent. down. Yeah, mowing down all of the yeah. obstacles so our kids don't have to. Yes. Okay, but there are also lawn mowing teachers, mm -hmm. and somehow uh, not getting to this those essential skills has to do with those lawn mowing teachers. I guess that's right. What do you think makes teachers to be those lawn mowers? I think it's a number of things. I think one of it is that there's a lot of pressure on teachers. Mm -hmm. There's a lot mm -hmm. of pressures to be successful. There's a lot of pressure for your students to be successful. You know, when I first started teaching, I was one of those people that just wanted to burn the whole system down. Like, this is stupid. We don't need standardized tests. We don't need grades. I don't need to teach my students really fine, minute content and subject matter. That's all stupid. I just want to burn it all down. But after doing this for a while, I, I, I realized there's a real world and there's a reality we have to exist in. And if I don't get my students ready for those tests, they're not going to do well and it's going to hurt them and then it will affect me as well. And that is the primary measure for a lot of them. And so if I just avoid that and ignore it, my students and myself are going to suffer. But if I put all of my emphasis in it, my students and myself are going to suffer. And so there's this balance. It's difficult to be a teacher. You've got this pressure. And so I think sometimes it's easy to just, you know, be the sage on stage hmm. to say, you know what, here's all the information. Here's the easiest way for you to digest it so that you can do well and I can keep my, myself clean and I can keep you successful. So I, th I think part of it's tied to that stress and that pressure that comes with it. And, and I also just think, and this is just my opinion, I think it's easier. I think it's easier mm. to be in control and then not release control. I know personally, I like lecturing. I'm pretty good at it. I like to communicate. I can do it for a long, 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 long time. And uh, so it's kind of just easy to go up there and just talk and give the information. And it's a lot harder to say, okay guys, get into groups and solve the problem yourself or hey go off on your own and learn this on your own and then report back to me that's that's messier mm -hmm. that's that's got a, uh, that's got challenge and danger to it mm -hmm. but like like i've been saying though the best stuff comes out of when we are challenged when we're in danger right when things are messy and so it's it's not easy but i i do think that's why we often want to be the curlers or the, the lawnmowers. Mm -hmm. That's Does that make true. sense? Yeah, of course. It, it totally makes sense. And I think it also has to do with trust in teachers. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of distrust. Uh, that's what makes it so stressful. That's right. Um, but another question is about measurement. I saw one of your slides uh, had a measurement in it, how you can uh, measure growth in collaboration. Yes. Uh, you skip that one quite quickly. Can you tell something more about that, like working with rubrics and stuff like that? Yeah, you know, there, there's some great rubrics. I developed one on uh, collaboration, but it's really to kind of give yourself an idea, a formative assessment to find out where are my students collaboratively. And, you know, like with the rubric, and that's in that, that resource that anybody can go download, but uh, the collaboration rubric is really just like a numerical one through four system that kind of describes what really strong collaboration looks like and what really weak collaboration looks mm -hmm. like. And so, if it, you know, if we have a collaborative activity and I use the rubric to figure out where my students are at, I can see, oh, okay, so Johnny is at a one right now. He needs some work on collaboration. I can zoom in and help him in that. Or, oh, he's really low at collaboration, and I've got this other student named Sophie who's really, really strong at collaboration. I'm going to put them in a group together yeah. and see if, like, we can help each other out. You know, I mean, I also use peer assessments and, and self-assessments. You know, assess each other. You know, say, like, oh, you know what? If I had to give a grade to this person right now on their collaboration skills, if I had to score them on the rubric, this is what I would give them and why. Now, uh, in my own class, I would never let a student give the grade to somebody else. They would suggest to me what they think the grade would be, mm -hmm. and then I make my own assessments and, and judge accordingly. Mm -hmm. But, you know, asking students, how are people collaborating around you? How are you collaborating? You know, maybe one person's like, oh, I give myself 100%. I'm the best collaborator. And then everybody else in the group is like, mm, they are a 20%. Or, you know what I mean? Whatever mm -hmm. the number is. Mm -hmm. They're not. And then it's like, well, you think you're doing really great. And everybody else doesn't. I'm, see I'm seeing some imbalance. What conversations do we need to have? Um, and so to me, it's really about how do I figure out where you're at and how we can get you better at it. But the beauty is also with a rubric is that you show that it's a skill that has to be maintained. It's not something right. that when you score 100% one time, it doesn't mean that you will score 100% the second time also, which happens yep. in the system with knowledge, uh, with testing knowledge. We imply that if somebody scores 100%, they know everything and they can move forward. 
But some, something I write about in my book is I, I relate it. I was a swimmer in high school. And so if I, it, I don't know if we have any swimmers out there, but if when I swam in high school, my first time I ever swam a 25 meter da- or 50 meter dash, I think I swam it in like 32 seconds. Not very good. However, I kept working at it and practicing and ga- getting better. And eventually I swam a 24 second um, 50 meter swim. It's like, wait a minute. So when that happens, we threw the twenty, we threw the, the old score out, right? That was no longer applicable. Mm-hmm. I got better at it. And that was my new personal best. And I think that's why how we have to think about it with any type of grading or information is, hey, this is the score you're at now, and here's what you can do to improve it. Here, you know what I mean? And when you do improve it, that's the one that we're going to focus on, and we're going to say this is where you're at now. But if you digress and you go back to where you were, it's like, all right, well, that's, I mean, we're going to use this as a kind of a meter to find out what kind of collaborator actually are you right now or any type of learning that we use. Yeah, and the thing is with, with rubrics, uh, the thing that I came to to uh, uh, see the last couple of months is that a rubrics somehow is a few bricks. So uh, that's a way how you can look at it. But when you uh, have four columns and you open up column two and column four, and you give the opportunity to students to fill in for themselves what growth they want to see for themselves, uh, you can also let your students, involve your students in creating the rubric. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. And I think I think those are the best rubrics when the students are part of the creation mm-hmm. of it. Because mm-hmm. let's be honest, it, well, sticking with the collaboration theme, students know what strong collaboration looks like versus weak collaboration. You know, there's a reason so many people di- detest uh, collaborative work. We all we all know how bad it can be, mm-hmm. right? Has I mean, have you ever been in a group before where somebody hogged it all and did all the work? Of course. Have you ever been in a group where some everybody slacked and you did all the work? Yeah, of course. Yeah, every one of our students know that as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think you know I talked about creating a collaborative culture. I think starting the school year by having discussions around that, saying, hey, let's make a list of all the reasons why we hate group work. Let's just mm-hmm. list them all. Get it all down there. Okay. What can we do this year to make sure that we minimize or eliminate all of these? What can we do? Let's make a contract and agree that we're not going to do these things. When you're making group contracts, can you all agree that you're not going to do these things? Mm -hmm. How can we eliminate bad collaboration? And then let's create a rubric around it. How, what would you say a bad collaboration looks like? Give me some descriptors. But you're right. I, giving students pa- empowerment to do that is powerful. And how do you do that? Do you Because your students, they, they, they take multiple classes, right? You're not their only teachers they have. Right. So do they form those, uh, um, how did you call class contracts? Do they mm-hmm. create them for uh, the entire, uh, their entire education in one year or only for your class? You know, that's a difficult thing. And that's why, you know, that's why I spend a lot of my time getting to talk to teachers in schools because I just want to push us all in a certain direction. I think the truth is I I can only really do what's in my own class Mm -hmm. and I can encourage others to do it as well. Um, But yeah, I mean, I think the idea I once the first school I ever worked in was a project based learning school. So everybody was on the same page about hands on experiential authentic learning. It was beautiful. Everybody was in the same agreement. And so we all had the same class contracts and everybody used the same lingo and processes and rubrics to make sure that we had this kind of successful learning. Um, But then I went to a much more traditional school and, you know, every classroom looked completely different and it was much harder to get everybody on the same page. And so that's why I just I think it's so important that we try to get everybody to understand the value of these essential skills and why it's important to keep pushing education that way. Um, because let's be honest, as a student, it can be really hard to go and spend five classes um, in classrooms where there's very little conversation, very little discussion, very mm-hmm. little collaboration. And then all of a sudden you get into my class and it's like, okay, now I want you to get into groups and talk to each other. It's like, well, I don't know how to do that. Or I just spent the whole day not doing that. Yeah. You know, I mean, that, 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 there's some inconsistency to it. And so yeah, that is definitely one of the primary challenges. I think. So what's the tip that you can give for the collaborative, te- collaborative teaching team? Because yeah. the collaborative class classroom can only exist if there is a collaborative teaching team as well. So what's, what's the first tip that you can give to those teaching teams and to the teachers that want to achieve that with their teaching team? Yeah, I think that's a great question. 
Um, I, first off, I think collaborative teaching is the best. Mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I can't recommend it enough. And, you know, I really learned that when I was down with you guys at edX a few years ago is, you know, this was an education conference, but it was really a design collaboration conference with the topic of education, right? Like everybody mm -hmm. there was treated as an artist or as the designer first. And then, you know, not that like being a teacher is minimized, but it's like, Hey, let's get in the mindset of being designers and then we're going to design education experiences, right? Is that, I mean, that's, that's, that's true. Way. and so it's like, to me, let's, uh, let's do the same with teachers, you know, like you are all designers and creatives, artists, collaborators, and let's, uh, let's use that creative juice to create really dynamic education experiences. And so just assuming, uh, just viewing everybody that way, mm -hmm. I think that's a, it's a mindset. Yeah. We're all designers first. We're all professionals, experts, creatives first. Now let's assume that everybody is on that same page and now we can collaborate together. Yeah. I saw this really great advice the other day. It said, assume that everybody is trying their best. I love that. You know, how do you talk to parents right now in this difficult time where we're doing virtual learning? Let's assume everybody's trying their best. True. You know, how do we deal with difficult teachers or students or whatever? Let's assume that everybody's trying their best. Let's start there and then we'll move forward. And if we zoom into this uh, uh, current situation, do you think there is a big difference between uh, physical collaboration and digital co collaboration, or is the essence of both the same? Yeah, I, I think the essence is the same. I think there's new obstacles and new limitations, new boundaries, but the essence is the same. Mm -hmm. You know, because I, I think one of the big misconceptions that people have of collaboration, that it means we're working with other people at all times. You know what I mean? No, that's not what collaboration is. Collaboration is about working together to achieve a certain task. And so if you and me were like, okay, you know what? We are going to throw a conference together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'll work on the, the graphic design. You work on getting people there. Somebody else will work on the content. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have a meeting. We'll come together and see if it's all meshing together. And then we'll go back out and all work on our own things. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of individual work happening there. But it's all for the same common cause, right? You know, look, look at what's going on. There's these vaccines being developed all over the world right now. And you've got professors in the Netherlands working with professors in California and in China. And they're all doing their own thing, but they're calling each other. They're sharing ideas. They're sharing research. They're sharing data. Mm -hmm. And then so there's individual work, but it's all for a collaborative effort. And so virtually right now, you know, let's give students work where they're still working with a team but they're able to do their part on their own. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. I always yeah. learned that there is a difference between collaboration and cooperation. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference there? Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And and, and yeah, I, I, again, I, I just think it's kind of echoing what I already said. Uh, we don't have to always be on top of each other. Mm -hmm. You know, collaboration, if you're an introvert, if your students are introverts, it doesn't mean they have to be around people talking all the time. That would drain their batteries so fast. Um, it just means that they're working with other people. They're having constant conversations when necessary in order to get to achieve whatever that goal is. Great. Um, I think we're going to round it up. Uh, okay. I want to thank you so very much for your time and for your great story. Uh, some viewers also thank you for your, uh, for your clear story and uh, your inspiration. I'm going to show that slide once again in which they can. Okay. Good tip for my side. So, uh, thank okay. you very much, Trevor, for your time, yeah. for your effort, and for your inspiration. And we are definitely going to speak each other again in the in the future. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Yep. You too. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Bye, bye. Take care.